Uh, my name is Dina Marchini. I'm from Portland State University in Portland, Oregon, U.S. Uh, my advisor is Mitch Cruzan, and I'm going to talk to you today about a study that's looking at adaptive genetic differentiation during the establishment of a newly invasive plant. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about what invasive species are. So here I have some pictures of invasive plants from around Oregon, located there in the U.S. And um, you can see even with even just with plants, they're very diverse. They cause a lot of economic and ecological damage. And they're defined as being species that are not native to their current environment. They survive without direct human involvement, and they spread from their sites of initial establishment. And this is why they're very interesting evolutionarily, because they possess these traits. They're species that move from one environment to another and are able to adapt over a short time span and really proliferate. In the new environment, we can use them as kind of like model organisms to look at um, adaptation in natural populations. So one question that's interesting is looking at um, why invasive species display trait divergence in their novel environments. So this is just a generic figure of uh, you know, different phenotypic frequencies in native and invasive populations of an invasive plant. And so an interesting question is looking at what the genetic processes underlying um, phenotypic, phenotypic divergence are. So for my study system, I use the invasive grass, Brachypodium sylvaticum. It's a perennial bunch grass with a mixed mating system. It's wind pollinated and guides forest understories of the Pacific Northwest U.S. So here's a um, picture here of a forest prior to Brachypodium sylvaticum invasion. You can see the dots of sword ferns, kind of like open ground. And after an invasion, um, the forest understory is a monoculture of Brachypodium sylvaticum uh, plants, kind of like a mat of grasses. It prevents other species from establishing. It was introduced in the early 20th century as a potential forage uh, species for cattle to Oregon. And, but many of the, um, or the original populations where it was first introduced remained dormant for a long period of time in their centralized regions in Oregon. And it didn't become invasive until um, the end of the 20th century when the populations of Brachypodium sylvaticum rapidly spread throughout central Oregon. And now um, it's distributed in Oregon, uh, Washington, then on the east coast of the U.S. in New York and Virginia. <coughs> And there's actually a separate introduction in California that I won't talk about right now. Um, so my study questions uh, for um, this, this study were to look at what traits have differentiated between invasive and native populations of Brachypodium sylvaticum, and then to look at the underlying evolutionary processes that resulted in trait differentiation, and then figuring out if trait differentiation occurred during the invasive establishment or after the subsequent range expansion after establishment occurred. So the first thing I had to figure out was what traits to measure. So I wanted to look and see what environmental stressors could be driving selection in the invasive range. So what I did is I performed climate matching. So we had um, some idea of the hypothesized source regions for the invasion of B. sylvaticum. So I took um, climatic data from those regions and I found that something that was majorly different was aridity, or like dryness of those regions. And here's an aridity index, and it's not super intuitive, but as you go down in arid, the aridity index, it means it's the area is more arid. And so here the red line is the invasive regions, and the green line is the native regions. And we can see that it's much more arid in invasive regions than in native regions, leading me to think that water stress might be a, a factor of driving selection in the invasive zone. So I measured 13 uh, functional, morphological, and physiological traits uh, in populations from invasive and native regions. And these are just two examples, looking at xylem morphology or looking at stomatal density in um, <coughs> selectin leaves. And I found that six of, or five of the traits that I measured were significantly different between invasive and native regions. And I'm not going to go into exactly what these traits are right now, but if you want to learn more about this kind of like phys and morphological stuff you can ask me later. And so when I saw that there were significant differences, I then looked at um, what the hypothesized uh, values, like changes in values would be for species um, in drought and in more like arid versus more 
uh, water available zones. And I compared the changes in values between invasive and native regions um, to see if they matched up with what would be predicted. And so that's what these arrows indicate, the direction um, in under um, water limitation. And I found that four of these traits that were significant uh, followed along with the hypothesis that in invasive regions, there's water limitation. And there, the plants are becoming drought adapted. However, um, I had to figure out what was driving this. Was it a selective process, so, such as diversifying selection, where we see increase in the variance of the trait? Or are these differences between native and invasive regions just the result of genetic thrift? So it's kind of a random evolutionary process uh, driven or as resulting from bottlenecks or founder effects in the invasive <laughs> region. Um, so is it selection or is it genetic drift? Uh, leading to my two hypotheses for um, these uh, for the differences in native and invasive phenotype, either through uh, drift, where we just have random processes for result of bottlenecks, or through actual selective processes um, driven by water limitation. And uh, again, going back to this question, my third question, um, there's also two stages at which this might be occurring in the invasive region. So we have the primary establishment phase when B. sabbaticum first arrives to the uh, invasive region, uh, where we can have selection occurring prior to range expansion after the life phase, where we would see um, differentiation not just between invasive and native regions, but also in between uh, populations existing in the invasive region. So in order to disentangle selection and drift occurring in the invasive region, I performed QST, FST comparisons, um, QST being quantitative trait differentiation, and FST being a proxy for genetic differentiation, and using neutral molecular markers, such as microsatellites, that are highly variable and not affected by selection. So doing our QST, FST comparisons, if we see if QST is approximately equal to FST, we would assume that no selection is occurring, and that trait divergence is a result of neutral evolutionary processes, such as drift. If QST is greater than FST, we would assume um, uh, diversifying selection. If QST is less than FST, we would assume homogenizing selection. So one of the problems with uh, looking at QST and FST between native and invasive regions is that a lot of invasive plants have a very broad uh, uh, native distribution. So here is an, a, a, a map of Brachypodium sylvaticum's native distribution. Here, and this is looking down from like the North Pole. Um, so this red area is where um, Brachypodium sabbaticum is native. So it's really uh, a wide distribution from uh, Eastern Europe to Western Europe into Russia and then the Middle East. And so if we just you group all these populations as one, um, we might find diversifying um, diversification in traits that is is erroneous because. It's possible that I mean not all of these populations are contributing to the native or to the invasive invasive populations. So we have to account and figure out what what was there to begin with. So I uh, um, was able to obtain uh, samples from uh, many populations within the um, native region, and I utilized the presence of unique alleles. So wait, the QST and FST. Um, for my uh, QST FST comparisons by these probabilities of contribution to the invasive zone. Okay? And so this provides us with a more robust test of divergence than if we were just to group all the native populations as one, so we can actually see uh, just, just a more exact way of finding um, divergence. So to test for QST FST significance, I utilized the Whitlock et al. 2009 uh, parametric bootstrapping method to create a null distribution of QST FST, um, integrating my uh, weights into the null distribution as well. And if QST FST is significant at the tail end of our null distribution, we consider that uh, divergence is occurred. And so here's the um, result of those null distributions. So these <coughs> graphs are histograms of the null QST FST. Uh, distribution um, for each trait, and these red lines are the actual QST minus FST. And as you can see here, the QST minus FST is at the is at the upper tail end of each of these null distributions, signifying adaptive gen genetic differentiation. 
uh, between the European and invasive Oregonian populations. However, I still need to go into answering my second question. So, what I found previous with the with the with the is that there's um, that there's differentiation between uh, Oregon and Europe. So that would be something according to the establishment period. But um, to figure out if there's further differentiation within Oregon during range expansion, I had to look for divergence within populations in Oregon. So to do that, what I did is repeat the qst fst comparison within Oregon using only Oregonian populations to see if there was any further divergence with the trait within the traits that I measured. And I didn't find any. So with all of the divergence that had occurred occurred prior to range expansion in the invasive zone. Um, during that um, that lag phase period. So, in conclusion, I found adaptive divergence in drought-resistant traits occurring during establishment <coughs> of, of the invasive species Rapoconium sylvaticum prior to selection. Um, and utilizing the addition of weights to my qsc fc comparison really um, increased the robustness for a test of adaptive divergence. And I'd like to thank uh, the Cruzan Lab at Portland State, my advisor Mitch Cruzan, and my undergrad uh, assistant at the time, Caitlin Murray, who did a lot of microscopy work, Tom Rosen Steele, Sarah Upley, and Chris Musial. And that all the questions. adaptation to drought tolerance in uh, Oregon, yeah. have, do you think it could just be maybe like maybe they've become polyploid? Has anyone done like a chromosome count? Because that's happened a lot in Spain with Dystachian. Oh, uh, with Dystachian. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Dystachian can, but I, I, we haven't seen polyploid in drought tolerance. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah.